Bada bing, bada bing. It's nighttime, and Sarah can't see clearly. There's just not a lot of light. But she does know that she's standing on the edge of a cliff. Below her are these jagged rocks with sea urchins just roaming about. The waves are crashing in. I mean, even if she jumps, she could land on a rock. She could injure herself. But if she doesn't injure herself, let's say she jumps and she's fine, then what? Is she really going to swim two miles to St. Thomas Island? Is this even in the right direction? What if the waves just push her back to the jagged rocks? But even then, knowing all of this, knowing what's waiting for her below seems better than what's waiting for her behind. Behind Sarah is Pedophile Island, where she would later state she has been held and essayed sometimes up to three times in a single day. Sarah is hesitating. She's running through all of the options. A straight jump would probably kill her, but maybe she could slowly climb down the rocks. Just get a bit closer and closer to the water and then inch her way in. She starts bending down and she hears these golf carts coming up behind her. She's got to move faster. But then there's another and another. And then the lights illuminate the entire space. And these two girls, two very young girls, a bodyguard, a model scout, and a middle-aged woman walk straight up to Sarah. Sarah starts panicking. But this middle-aged woman gently walks closer to her, to the cliff, like a little cat. It's okay, honey. Come with us. Sarah looks back. I mean, she's still thinking, I could still jump. I mean, it's going to kill me, but I could still jump. But she's got no choice. She takes the woman's hand and walks back with them. Back to the island where there are bungalows filled with girls in Victoria's Secret lingerie and food that she's not even allowed to touch. She has no choice but to go back to the island formerly known as Little St. James. But to her and hundreds of other girls, it's known as Petal Island or island or just hell We would like to thank today's sponsors who have made it possible for Rotten Mango to support Rain, the nation's largest anti violence organization. They created and operated the National Essay Hotline and all resources will be linked in the show notes as well as the description. This episode's partnerships have also made it possible to support Rotten Mango's growing team of dedicated researchers and translators. And we would also like to thank you guys for your continued support as we work on our mission to be worthy advocates of these causes. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com but there is a beautifully heartbreaking, I mean gut-wrenching book on this case called Silence No More and it's written by Sarah Ransom. She is a victim of Epstein and Maxwell and just her sheer tenacity to keep fighting for justice is beyond admirable. I would highly recommend checking the book out. Virginia Jufre is another victim that was pivotal in Epstein's second arrest. Both of them have countless interviews as well as articles where they have shared their stories through their own words. Many of the other victims have as well and I would highly recommend going to listen to those first. Some victims names, identifying information, and dialogue have all been changed for privacy. Due to all the ongoing lawsuits for legal and professional reasons, we will be using the word allegedly, even if authorities or the general public believe it is a fact. However, our intention is not to cast doubt on victims' testimonies. Any and all theories mentioned are netizen speculation only. And with that being said, I want to make it very clear that all of the details in today's episodes can be easily found online. We are not investigative journalists, and if you ever feel in any episode that something was miscommunicated, misrepresented, or have any additional information that you would like us to know, please let us know down in the comments. With that being said, the very last episode that we've uploaded was part one of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell's crimes. I would recommend checking that out before diving into this one. We went through Jeffrey Epstein's death very briefly, his childhood, his life, how he made his money, a lot of the crimes that he committed, some of the relationships that he had. And now this episode is going to focus more on Ghislaine Maxwell because she's got a very important part to play in all of this. We didn't talk about her at all. Not much at all. 
but mm. she's been there the whole time. So with that being said, let's get started. Headington Hill Hall. I mean, it seems straight out of Bridgerton. It is this English style castle-like estate in England with 51 rooms, a tennis court, swimming pool, of course, 24 seven guards posted at the main entrance, fences with barbed wire on the outer layers of the property. There's video cameras drilled into tree trunks and the lawn doubles as a helipad. I mean, the house is so massive, there's a full scale parking lot in front, multiple gardens, like, you know, the tiered gardens, the multi-level gardens. I mean, this house is full of history. It was built in 1824, and it's said that Oscar Wilde, the author known for the picture of Dorian Gray, had attended parties there. But now, the 50-room castle was owned by a single family, the Maxwells. The Maxwells of Pergamon Press, one of the largest publishing houses in the UK at the time. Now, Robert Maxwell, the patriarch of the family, would later go on to own the Daily Mirror, which is one of the biggest publications in the UK with kind of a seedy reputation. They're, they're considered more of a tabloid newspaper, but massive nonetheless. And Robert Maxwell was worth $1.9 billion. The Maxwells are not just rich, they're filthy rich. She was born rich. She was born with a diamond spoon in her mouth. During Christmas, there's usually this beautifully lit up three-story tall tree inside the mansion. I mean, this is extravagance. It's opulence. If any of the Maxwell kids, Robert Maxwell had nine of them, if any of them wanted to know when daddy's coming home, all they would do was wait for the noise of the helicopter. And he would land on the front lawn and they would run outside. And most Sundays, Robert Maxwell would host Sunday brunch for all the industry leaders in the media world that he felt like he wanted to spend more time with. And he would invite them over to his house for brunch. Now, technically, this invitation is optional. I mean, you can turn it down if you want. Of course you can. There's such a thing as free will. But it's Robert Maxwell, billionaire, controller of the media. I would hardly call it a choice. Perhaps you turned down a Sunday brunch because you made other plans. The next day, your front page on Daily Mirror with an article about how your company is going down south or allegations about how you're a horrible person to work for. So every single Sunday, the men in suits, they would find themselves driving up this long, windy road past the lush trees through the giant property until they finally get up to Headington Hill Hall. You know what they called him, right? They called him a brazen, impatient, rude, insufferable, intolerant scoundrel with a monstrous ego. That's what they called him in the press the other day. You know what Robert responded back? What? He said, I plead guilty to all of it. Oh, geez. His poor wife, Betty, she's like a poor dormouse. She's so quiet, so shy. I mean, at a recent party he threw at the mansion, Robert, in front of his wife, was hitting on another married woman. And when that married woman said, oh, no, thank you, I'm not interested, you know what he did? I heard he turned around straight to that married woman's young daughter, maybe 20 years old, and hit on her in front of everyone. The Maxwell family was known to be a bit strange. Robert Maxwell would attend galas and work functions with this beautiful young woman on his arm. And if you didn't know, you might think that's his wife. Billionaire marries young, beautiful woman. It makes sense. She was always dressed in the most expensive gowns. I mean, he would stare at her lovingly and show her off to everyone in the room. Isn't she just beautiful? It was his 22-year-old daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell. So when all the business executives walk into the estate for Sunday brunch, they are led to the formal dining room and they find Robert seated at the head of the table. He looks up to greet them. They smile. They look down near his legs. And there is his daughter, 22-year-old Ghislaine Maxwell, kneeling at her father's feet under the table. Doing what? Just tears streaming down her face, eyes red, snot, everything. Robert Maxwell was completely ignoring her. Take a seat, everyone. Everyone at that lunch that day had to eat and talk to each other about business, make jokes with Robert Maxwell, how's the printing business, all the while acting like Ghislaine Maxwell, the billionaire's daughter, was not at his knees under the table sobbing. It was bizarre. But there would just always be two men who Ghislaine's whole life revolved around. She did everything to please them, to make them happy, to feel loved by them. The first being her billionaire father, who would be found dead in the water near his super yacht with suspicions on whether or not he was murdered. Then her billionaire boyfriend, who would be found dead in a prison cell with suspicions on whether or not he was murdered. Her father was the disgraced Robert Maxwell of Pergamon Press and her boyfriend, the disgraced Jeffrey Epstein of Pell Island. 
Maria was running down the hall of the massive New York City townhouse. Some people said this place felt haunted. I mean, the color palettes were always mainly burgundy and deep, rich, dark colors, which is beautiful. I'm sure it all costs a fortune, but it has this suffocatingly grim, atmospheric undertone to it all. There was a taxidermy tiger in the office, a giant stuffed giraffe. There was a life-sized female doll hanging from a chandelier in one room. And in the master bathroom, there were just boobs hung up on the wall. Not paintings, not drawings, or even pictures. Fake breasts mounted on the wall, like suction cup to the wall, so the owner of the mansion could take a bath and play with the breasts on the wall. But frame it as artwork type of thing? I don't even think they were framed. Oh. It was like a villain in a cartoon movie was given a billion dollars. This is the type of house that they would build. But some rooms in the 40 plus room estate were genuinely beautiful. Some of the ceilings had elaborate murals painted on them. I mean, one was like the sky and the clouds with angels and you look up and you feel like you're staring at the clouds. I mean, regardless of how beautiful these rooms were, there was just always this creepy energy about the place. And even more so now. Maria ran to her room at the end of the hallway and she slammed the door shut and she looked around panicked. She moved this giant piece of furniture up against the door to block them from coming into her room. She would stay there until she thought it was safe to escape. The night before, the wife, the lady of the house as they call her, came to Maria in a bathrobe and asked her to follow her to the husband's room. The room that Maria's like never allowed to go into. Maria worked for them. She's not a guest. She's not a friend. She's not a colleague. She's a young employee in her 20s. The woman opened the door and there was this middle-aged man just laying in his bed. I mean, the whole energy felt obviously unprofessional, but Maria felt like she had to go with it. The lady tells her, rub his feet. What? <laughs> Maria was disgusted. She didn't want to rub his feet. That's not what she was hired to do. I mean, what other option does she have? Get fired? So she sits down, removes the blanket from his feet, and starts rubbing it. She's trying not to be good at it so that she can leave ASAP. But the man asks her to sit in bed with him, in between him and his wife, partner, whoever she was. Maria felt like she can't say no. So she gets into the bed, into the middle, and they proceed to assault her. Together, Maria stated the wife was wiping her tears and rubbing on her. Eventually, Maria found the chance and the opportunity to get up, run out of the room, run down the hallway, back to her room. Maria pushed up a giant piece of furniture to the door so that they couldn't come in, and she did not sleep at all that night. The next morning, she's trying to wait for them to leave for the day or leave for work so that she can run through this massive 30,000 square foot mansion to find a way out, and she's listening. And then her phone rings. She puts it up to her ear. Hello? It was the wife. What do you want? Nothing. I don't want anything. I'm going to the police. Maria called the FBI. She told them everything. She told them how she was hired to work at Jeffrey Epstein's mansion in New York City, where she was assaulted by Jeffrey Epstein and his wife partner. She doesn't know, but her name is Ghislaine Maxwell. She told them everything that she knew, everything that had been weird since she got to New York City. She met the couple in Palm Beach. She thought they were a married couple and they just were patrons of the arts. That's what they told her. Maria is an artist. She was excited when Jeffrey offered her a job in New York City to live in his townhome full time in the city of art and help him purchase art but when she gets there that's not her role her role is to work the door every day maria would just sit by this big 15 foot tall oak door of the new york mansion one of the largest private residences in the city just like a few blocks from central park and she would sit by the door with this white notebook and her role was to log everyone that came in and out of the house really Everyone had to sign in when they visited, even if they were just delivering something. I mean, it was mind-numbing, tedious work that was in her job description. But it also meant Maria saw everyone who came and went. She immediately noticed a lot of young teen girls in school uniforms coming into the house. The first time it happened, she probably thought, maybe it's a relative or something. But the second, third, fourth time, Maria's getting confused. She's getting alarmed. It's not like they have a high school kid that's inviting friends over. What business would this older couple have bringing high schoolers into their mansion? Maria gently brought it up to Ghislaine, the lady of the house. And she just told her, they're here to audition for Victoria's Secret. You know, Jeffrey is very close friends with Leslie Wexner, the CEO of Limited Brands, the ones that own Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works. So I go and I scout for models at Central Park. They come in for an audition. And if they're lucky, they'll be models. From then on, Ghislaine would scout in front of Maria. 
It was just odd. Sometimes they'd be in the car and Ghislaine would be like, stop the car. The driver would park in the middle of Central Park or near private schools. Ghislaine would just hop out, run over to a high school girl in her uniform, give her her number, and then run back to the car. That's insane. Just in the middle of New York. Yes. Wow. And it was ballsy. They would target private schools where these are pretty privileged kids too. Maria would later see these same girls at the house and the whole thing, I mean, I guess it made sense, right? But then Maria started seeing some red flags. She couldn't shake the feeling that they're not auditioning for Victoria's Secret. Like the whole thing is weird. Side note, Maria herself is really young, so she doesn't know how these things work. But Maria's thinking, first of all, the parents aren't coming with them, which is weird. Like if you're getting scouted to be a model for some sort of career, your parents would likely come. Second of all, some of the girls have braces. Maria's like, I don't remember the last time I saw a model with braces. And third, the girls were auditioning for Victoria's Secret, so Ghislaine said. And they're way too young to even have any breasts, really. Most of them didn't even have any breasts. So she's like, this is just kind of weird. Maria's sitting at the stool in the front when one of the young schoolgirls comes running down the stairs, crying, screaming, and just she just rushes out. Maria turns around and Ghislaine is standing there. Oh no, like what happened? What's wrong? She didn't get the job, that's what's wrong. Some girls are not cut out for modeling. Maria starts feeling really sick in that house. I mean, the way that Ghislaine talked about the girls, like they were auditioning to be models and the way the couple treated the house staff. I mean, all the house staff were treated like useless peasants. Anyone that was deemed beneath the couple were subhuman. It was shocking. Sometimes Ghislaine would even call somebody a nobody to their face. At the entrance of this massive townhome, they actually have what they call the living chessboard. It's a chessboard with figurines, And each one is a staff member, modeled after the staff member and custom made. They're all just chess pieces. So imagine you're the housekeeper of this house. You Mm -hmm. come and you're cleaning the chessboard and you're like, why does this chess piece look exactly like me? Why does this look like the maintenance man? Why does this look like the assistant? They made like a custom chess, but looks like The staff members, yeah. That of is the house. so weird. It's so bizarre. And they just like moving them around like a little yeah. chess. But like, only the workers, not themselves. No, they're just pawns and they're gods of the masters of the universe. Oh, that's so sick and twisted. Yeah. But also oh, wow. the psychology of coming to work and yeah. you're on a chess board. One day, Ghislaine walked over to Maria at the front and she pointed. Look at that pinhole right next to you. Maria looked. I mean, it looked odd. Was it? reflective or something it it looked like there was a hidden camera or something there so maria later asked jeffrey about it and he took her into a room where the entire desk was lined with screens and cctv footage of secret cameras throughout the property which is to be expected this is a massive mansion with artwork that cost millions of dollars the painting alone behind jeffrey epstein's desk which side note we went through this whole desk thing in the first episode okay but uh it's 20 feet long (laughs) This is like a dining table of a desk. It's the most massive desk people have ever seen in their lives. But behind it is a painting of a woman in a red dress. And she's pulling down one part of her dress to just expose one breast and she's cupping it. That painting alone is $6 million. So having a lot of security precautions is not the alarming part. It's to be expected. The alarming part is that Maria is inching closer to the screens and she sees that most of the CCTV footage is inside the house, inside the bedrooms, and even the restrooms, where you would expect full privacy. There were hidden cameras. If you were anywhere in this house, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were watching you. And the FBI did nothing about it. They took her call and they said, okay, thanks, and hung up. Is it because it's just private resident? They can do whatever they want? No, Maria was essayed. She was assaulted by them. They're basically saying it's your word against a billionaire's. Uh. There's a saying in New York, the only sin in New York City is not having money. And Ghislaine Maxwell was a sinner. So she invited a few acquaintances over to her New York City place to repent. Now, I'm not sure if they all knew what they were there for, for a tea party. I mean, they show up to the address on time. It's this giant brownstone on the Upper East Side, and they knock on the door, and a staff member of the Maxwell New York City property ushers them in. So this is not Jeffrey Epstein's house. This is Ghislaine Maxwell's New York City townhouse. Mm -hmm. Right this way, Madam will be with you shortly. 
They're like, madam, they step into the foyer and absolutely nothing in this house is subtle. I mean, everything is in your face, but it's not tacky. It's not, it's like eclectic. It's rich, it's in your face, but it's just interesting. I mean, rich people are so weird. Take it whatever way you want, but it's not beige. The whole place is royal blue, red, and black. There's ornamental china everywhere. There's samurai suits on the wall. It's just fascinating. They get ushered up to the living room where they find Ghislaine surrounded by her father's photos, family photos, business awards that her dad received, and she's just weeping on the floor. No introductions, no hellos, no pleasantries. Ghislaine just starts allegedly screaming at them, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. She was wearing nothing but her undergarments dripped in expensive jewels like diamonds all over her neck, wrists, fingers, weighed down by diamonds, pearls. She had a full face of makeup on. She went from screaming to quietly but still dramatically complaining to everyone. And side note, people said that her voice was always like a low purr. Hmm. I'm broke, do you hear me? I'm broke. The guests look at her. I mean, this is so over the top. They're in a very clearly expensive brownstone. I mean, if you're really broke, you could probably sell that samurai armor suit downstairs. They're staring at all the diamonds just dripping from her neck and wrist. It was, even by high society standards, very out of touch. It was so abnormal. What's going on? Yeah, why is she not wearing clothes? She's having a moment. But she had all the jewelries on. Exactly. It's was like, this a choice she made? It seems like it. Okay. It seems like she wanted to be in some sort of soap opera. But everyone there, they, they try to be sympathetic. Ghislaine Maxwell was a sinner. She had no money anymore. Because Robert <laughs> Maxwell, her beloved father, was dead. Robert Maxwell was found naked, dead, floating in the ocean near his $15 million super yacht named the Lady Ghislaine. After his favorite kid. Really? Ghislaine was daddy's little girl, his little mascot. So it's very understandable that she was very distraught over his death. But it, even this was just a bit much. But wouldn't he just leave everything to her? Oh, we're going to get into it. Okay. Even when Robert Maxwell was still alive, Ghislaine was incredibly proud to be his daughter, but in kind of an alarming way. She once pulled aside a family friend of theirs, and I guess they're slightly disagreeing on something. And she turned on him and she said, don't forget, I'm daddy's girl. And he was like, what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Then she would turn around to her dad and suddenly she'd be very quiet and timid and snuggle up on him, sit on his knee. She worked her dad. I mean, she knew what he wanted from her and she became this blank canvas for him. But now, now he's dead and nobody knew why. I mean, they did and they didn't. Three pathologists disagreed on the exact cause of death. There are theories circulating that he had a heart attack and fell into the water, then died by accidental drowning. One person close to Robert Maxwell argued that Robert always woke up in the middle of the night, butt naked. He would walk over in the dark to the edge of his yacht to pee off the side. They speculated that he probably fell and drowned. Side note, Robert Maxwell had a thing for urinating off of the sides of things. Allegedly, he urinated off the top of the mirror paper headquarters just like the roof. So a stream of pee was shooting down. I digress, but yeah. Others thought- <laughs> This is so out of this yeah, world, bro. You think that's out of this world? Robert Maxwell had known links to the British Secret Intelligence Service, as well as the Soviet KGB, as well as Israeli intelligence. He was a secret spy for like all three of them. The speculation was that he might've known something that he shouldn't have, or maybe he got cocky. And he thought that with his billions of dollars, it would protect him from some of the most powerful entities in the world. And he started asking for things. Or maybe he was trying to get more for his end of the deal, whatever deal he had with them. I mean, obviously, this is purely speculation, but people argued, knowing Robert Maxwell's personality, where he is constantly described as a bombastic, egomaniacal bully, nobody thought he would have gone quietly, nor would he have self-exited. So there's a lot of theories circulating that he was murdered. And some people just believe that, no, he self-exited on the Lady Ghislaine near the Canary Islands. Because a few weeks after Robert's death, Maxwell's empire caught fire and burned to the ground. Authorities discovered a half-billion-dollar hole in the pension funds of the company. He had taken from his employees' pension so that he could stay afloat. When Robert Maxwell died, his net worth was negative $1 billion. Oh, my God. It's speculated that he realized this 
and there was no more that he could do. They were going to go under. The boat was sinking. So it's either go to jail, live in disgrace, or exit off the Lady Ghislaine. So the speculation is he chose to exit. That's what some people speculate. Ghislaine doesn't believe that he would have self-exited. But none of that mattered. The Maxwell family name was wrecked. And she could either stay in London where everybody hates her guts and try to rebuild it from the bottom up. Or she could move to a whole new city and see if she could reinvent herself. That's exactly what she did. Ghislaine Maxwell came to New York City, got a place on the Upper East Side. And the obvious answer for someone like Ghislaine is to either A, get a job. I mean, you've got a degree from Oxford, one of the top five universities in the world. Or B, do what a lot of other high society people do, get a husband. So she technically still has some money, but not yeah. a lot. Like, she doesn't have billions, but she's <laughs> right. not broke. Yeah, yeah. She has diamonds and she's, a mansion. She's and... got probably uh, speculating tens of millions. Dang. But not billions. Now, the people in attendance at this very bizarre broke tea party, they thought she's going to be fine. She's going to be fine. First of all, she's not broke. Second of all, she's just going to find another man to finance her life. And that's okay. Because Ghislaine was always the type of girl that guys liked. Ghislaine once threw a big dinner party at her house. And usually guys are notorious for complaining about going to these dinner parties. They don't find it fascinating. They don't find it exciting. It's just another dinner with more people that you have to make small talk with. It's just not that fun. But the guys, they loved Ghislaine's parties. One of the attendees stated Ghislaine was a masterful hostess. I mean, it was like her life's calling. She knew how to cater to everybody's needs, but not in like this overly nice, I'm trying to please you or impress you way. It was almost just a level of class that exuded out of her. Just sophistication, very graceful. The tables were always beautifully arranged. The food was prepared by chefs and it was absolutely delicious. And then after dinner, Ghislaine disappeared. Eventually, she comes back to the dinner table holding a big stack of silk scarves. Everyone, come, come. We're going to play a game. She starts passing out the scarves only to men. Blindfold yourselves. The objective of the game is all the men will have their eyes covered and the women will take off all of our tops and bras and we will walk around letting the guys guess who is who based on how the breasts feel. Based on weight, cup size, they can guess. You're kidding me. Yeah, most of the guys were like, now that's how you throw a dinner party. They really liked Ghislaine. They thought, what a cool girl. But the girls, they feel so uncomfortable and in a way betrayed. Like what woman in their right mind would peer pressure all these other women into a game like this? Yeah, yeah. And are they couples or is no. all sing everyone single? Some couples, some single. People said Ghislaine was more like a man than a woman. And that's why men liked her. She was sharp, witty, a night owl not saying that that's like male specific okay but that's what people were saying about her and she only wore the most expensive clothes like broke or not she only wore the most expensive clothes and she just had these very interesting ways of flirting i, I don't know if you can call it flirting allegedly one time at a wedding galen was flirting with a married man not the groom but a guest married nonetheless and she's caressing his arm laughing at his jokes and his wife comes up behind him like who the hell is this lady trying to rub up on my husband the husband turns to introduce his wife to galane but galane looks her up and down and what is this <laughs> galane loops her arm around the husband's arm and walks him off into the crowd whoa at another party, Ghislaine walked up to a writer. I believe this is the first time they're meeting. This writer is married. They're three minutes into a random, bland, pleasant conversation, small talk. The writer's wife is like five feet away. Ghislaine looks him in the eye mid-conversation, interrupts him. If you lose 10 pounds, I'll f*** you. Another guy dropped her off at her townhouse, and when she got out of the car, she leaned down through the window and said, if you come in and f*** me, I'll tell you the secrets of my father. It was, um aggressive it's like the concept of whatever i want i get it was just embedded into her dna it appears like she could not process any other outcome for her life other times it wasn't as straightforward she would allegedly meet a man at a high society party lift her eyes up at them and a lot of them describe her way of looking at people as utterly compelling she was very charismatic, very magnetic, almost in a cruel way. Like, you know that she's mean, but for some reason, you want her to like you. The moment she looked at you, you would engage in two seconds of small talk with Ghislaine because this is your first time meeting, right? And you'd say things like, well, I, I work in finance and the main object. Will you take me out to dinner? She would just say it so casually, like, oh, I like your pants, kind of like that. 
And it worked most of the time. I mean, it didn't hurt that Galen is beautiful. She's really electric. You wanted to be around her because it almost made you feel good. Like, this is a really cool person. And if they enjoy spending time with me, that must mean I'm cool. That's how Galen made you feel. So one of the guys ends up taking her to dinner to this nice little restaurant. And for the first half of dinner, I mean, everything's going well. She's a great conversationalist. I mean, nothing ever felt boring with her. And then halfway through the dinner, the conversation of her dad comes up very subtly. It's not like he's like, who's your dad? Tell me about your dad. Did he die? What happened? It just seemed casual. It would have been one remark and that's it. But it wasn't. She did not talk about anything else the whole dinner. I mean, once that conversation about her dad came up, all she talked about was how great her dad was, how incredible it was to be a part of his family and how great he did for his businesses, how she would open up the daily newspaper and there would be an article about him because he was that prominent of a figure. By the end of the dinner, she had been so loud and people were so interested in the story of her billionaire father. The entire restaurant was quiet and listening in. And it was just, it was so odd. The man said, you know, on one hand, Galena's so confident and magnetic and she's so straightforward. She's constantly hitting on guys and making the first move. But on the other hand, you could tell that she's severely insecure. It felt like she's got a lot going on inside. And like a nice gentleman, he probably thought maybe it's best to let her work through these things on her own before she starts dating people. But to some guys, they are drawn to that insecurity. They can smell it from a mile away like blood in the water. And Jeffrey Epstein was one of those guys. One day, Christina gets a call from Ghislaine. Christina's an author and kind of an acquaintance of Ghislaine. I mean, I would hardly call them friends. They're cordial. They know of each other. They run in the same circles, but that's about it. Christina gets this call out of the blue. You need to come over right now. Christina rushes to meet up with Ghislaine at her apartment. And the minute that she walks into the door, it's like she's getting pitched. Ghislaine is confident. Her voice is strong. You're going to make a lot of money, Christina. You are going to meet everyone. Your life is about to change. I'm sorry, what's going on? Live with me for a year. Move in so you can learn everything about me. And you're going to help me write a book. I'm sorry, what? A book isn't entirely a bad idea. I mean, Ghislaine does have a lot of high-profile friends. Her dad was mysteriously dead billionaire Robert Maxwell. She was also super close with members of the British royal family while she was studying at Oxford. She befriended Prince Andrew. She bragged about how she made Princess Diana cry. Yeah, just another reason to hate Ghislaine. She went to the Clinton's daughter's wedding. I mean, she was connected to all the people who ruled the world. But it's still such an odd random request. Like, they don't even know each other. Live with her for a year. Like, drop everything in Christina's life and live with Ghislaine for a year. Do people even care that much about her at this point? Christina is not convinced. And I think Ghislaine could see that. So she switches her tone and she stands in front of her big window overlooking the city. And she says, you have to write this book for me because I want Jeffrey to marry me. I need him to see me in a more elevated light with a book written about me. He'll do it. He'll marry me if there's a book on me. Okay, Christina's like, now it's clicking. Christina now understands why she was called out of the blue. Everyone who even knew of Ghislaine in New York City, everyone in these circles knew that she was absolutely infatuated with Jeffrey Epstein. The author that Ghislaine invited, she knew this. Just a few months ago, there was an incident that she thought was kind of strange. Whether it was genuine curiosity or just like a small talk sake, the author asked Ghislaine, my goodness, Ghislaine, how are you keeping yourself so thin? Ghislaine looked at her and very confidently, like this is not a raging red flag, said, Jeffrey likes his girls thin. Well, still, how do you do it? Well, did you ever see anyone in a concentration camp with any weight on them? No, because they didn't eat. So I call it the Nazi diet. I just don't eat. Side note, both Ghislaine and Jeffrey Epstein were Jewish. So that is a really bizarre. She just says, I just don't eat. The reason that Jeffrey keeps me around to begin with is that I don't make mistakes. It was such an odd conversation. What does that even mean? Are they dating? If so, what kind of mistakes are you talking about? I mean, it seemed like they were less of a couple and more like a team. The author remembers going to parties thrown by Ghislaine at Jeffrey Epstein's massive townhouse in Manhattan, one of, like I said, the largest private residences. She would show up and Bill Clinton would just be there. (laughs) 
Whoa. Or sometimes Prince Andrew would just be in attendance, you know? And it seemed like a two-person team. Ghislaine would be connected to all these powerful people through the Maxwell name. She would bring them to Jeffrey, into his den, literally and figuratively, and he would do business with them. So Ghislaine was more old money in that sense. Mm -hmm. But not really. Okay, so it's complicated. The Maxwell family were actually ridiculed often in the UK for being Novu rich, like new money rich, just obnoxious. They're not aristocrats. They're not royalty. They're mm -hmm. not classy, but they're still connected with a lot of people with titles. So compared to Jeffrey Epstein, who's just this vulgar finance dude on Wall Street, I mean, she's got connections. At the stage that when they met, what stage of career is Jeffrey Epstein? Like he's already made it at that no, point? No, he's... Oh kind of on his way okay. like i would say he's made it but probably not to the status he will be through galane uh so galane's genuinely just attracted by this person rather than his status oh no he has money no okay. status but he's got money so she likes the fact that he's rich yeah. and yeah. she just genuinely really attracted to him yeah so he he still has that new york city apartment by the time that galane is inviting all these people over the biggest the biggest apartment. private residence okay. in so new york city so he's very very wealthy already yeah 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 but i i don't think that he was at his peak in terms mm. of finances when they first met okay i think through galane he ends up making a lot more money now, Epstein was really not a likable person, even in Ghislaine circles. I mean, to give you context, Epstein had some powerful friends. So if you remember from part one, he was friends with like Leslie Wexner, the billionaire behind limited brands that owns Victoria's Secret. But Epstein's circle is still, like I said, limited to this finance world. And even there, Epstein was just a bit too much. Like either you hate him for being so vulgar and bizarre, or you like him because you convince yourself, wow, this rich guy doesn't take himself too seriously. Ghislaine, she's a Maxwell. She went to Oxford University. She's very close friends with Prince Andrew. I mean, he threw her a birthday party in England once. She's close friends with the Clintons. It's just a different league. Side note, allegedly, whenever Jeffrey Epstein and Prince Andrew were at a party together, people said it was the most boring party in the world because it seemed like they had, allegedly, this competition was who could look the most disinterested and bored. What? Yeah, so the two of them, they would just be sulking in their corner. They looked like they were too intellectual, too high class to be entertained by anything. Another source that was at one of these dinner parties said Prince Andrew thought it was absolutely hilarious that people were so fascinated by Kate Middleton's wedding. So this was like right before they were going to get married. And he thought it was so, he was in hoots because everybody was like, what is she going to wear? Oh my gosh, who's coming? Who's invited? And he just thought, look at these peasants. Hee <laughs> <laughs> what? This is so funny. <laughs> Ghislaine's friends thought Jeffrey Epstein was weird. I mean, firstly, his New York City apartment was strange, strange design. But also at these dinner parties, if they were mid-conversation and Jeffrey Epstein found himself getting bored, he would just interrupt everybody and scream. And what does that have to do with pussy? That was his favorite saying. Ghislaine would be the only one sincerely laughing. Everyone would just be glancing at each other and awkwardly chuckling because what the hell is that? It's so crazy these two found each other. Yeah. They're so weird in their own way already. I, I can see, in hell. Right, I already can see yeah. how this is going to like go. Escalate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ghislaine's friends would ask her, wait, so what does he do for work? Oh, he's the money manager. But he only takes on clients with at least a billion dollars to manage. So now, Christina, back in the apartment, is no longer interested in writing Ghislaine's book. She's not going to waste a year of her life writing a book for Ghislaine just so Ghislaine could get proposed to. Like, what kind of deal is that? But Ghislaine keeps begging. Jeffrey has been medically diagnosed by the best doctors in the world. He needs three orgasms a day. Sometimes he has an erection that lasts 24 hours. No way. Christina's like, excuse me? And what does that have to do with this? Exactly. Christina felt like, Am I on drugs? Is she on drugs? And like, what chapter of a book would that even go into? <laughs> the opener. <laughs> <laughs> the author's note. I mean, Ghislaine's like, I cannot keep up with his needs. So I drive around. I look for girls that are his type. Then I offer them a deal. Do you want to give a rich man a massage for a few hundred bucks? Christina's like, what are you talking about? What I do in Palm Beach is I get in my car, I drive to the trailer parks. I look for Jeffrey's type. And when I see what I'm looking for, I approach them. I bring them to the house. 
The way Ghislaine described what she does for Jeffrey is interesting. It's so casual yet so professional. Casual in the sense that Ghislaine talks about picking up these girls like she's picking up takeout for her boyfriend, just debating on which meal he's craving and then going to pick it up. But at the same time, you can tell that Ghislaine takes it very seriously. It's like a career, a profession. Apparently, she would even leave parties early to go pick up girls for Jeffrey. So at this point, are they dating or are they Nobody romantic? Knows. So Nobody knows. it's speculated that they started off briefly romantic mm. and then they were no longer romantic, became best friends and codependent on each other for various things. Jeffrey Epstein was probably dependent on Ghislaine Maxwell for her connections. And I think that he liked being associated with her. She was really good at hosting. She was doing all the wifely duties without him having a wife. She's hosting these parties for these business partners and getting him more clients for whatever he's doing. And she's just obsessed with him. She's obsessed with him and he's paying her a lot of money. Mm. We don't know how much. So it's almost like ex-girlfriend, employee, best friend. It's just weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's no definitive timeline or a strong point of when it transitions. Mm. It's very odd. But it does seem like she's obsessed with him. Whether she wants to marry him for the money or for the love, it's unclear. Christina looks at Ghislaine. Wait, (laughs) but who are these girls? What are you even talking about right now? And Ghislaine whips around and says, they are nothing. They are trash. Christina was taken aback. I mean, Ghislaine was clearly desperate for Epstein. I mean, enough to go and find girls for him to sleep with three times a day. And she still wants to marry him. But not only that, she's talking about these women like they're subhuman. They're nothing but slots to fill in Jeffrey's busy schedule. Christina walked out of that apartment that day disgusted. She had no idea that Ghislaine Maxwell was talking about children. 14-year-old girls. One of the most iconic stores in New York City was Henry Bendel on Fifth Avenue. The brand's colors are brown and white stripes. I don't know if you guys remember Henry Bendel. And at one point, a lot of wealthy women would go there to shop. It's like a department store, so they have a little bit of everything there. And Liz was working there, assisting a woman. And Liz was asking, wait, how do you spell your name? I'm so sorry. It sounds like the French spelling of gasoline. And the woman said, it's Ghislaine. And my boyfriend thinks I'm a lot like gasoline. I'm the gasoline and he's the match. So Liz and the woman, Ghislaine, they start busting out laughing. I mean, I've worked in retail before. These are like the best clients. Sometimes in luxury retail, you have people who take themselves way too seriously. And you feel like as the salesperson, you have to walk on pins and needles because they're so prim. They're so proper. But then you have someone walk in buying stuff and they're so fun to be around. It is like the best part of your day. And Liz is genuinely having a good time. She feels like she's making a friend. Ghislaine picked out a ton of stuff and requested that Liz drop it off at her hotel nearby later tonight night. Which, I mean, it isn't completely unheard of in Manhattan in luxury department stores. So Liz is like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I'm kind of excited to see her again. Not in the, oh, I can't wait to spend time with her, but more so at least it'll be fun to drop it off with this client rather than a different client. So Liz hauls all the bags to the hotel. She gets there. The concierge was expecting her. He escorts her to the dimly lit hotel bar where Ghislaine is sitting with a man. This is my friend Jeffrey Epstein. Hello. They had Liz sit down and she remembers thinking, wow, if Ghislaine is electrifying, Jeffrey's on fire. I mean, the two of them are just so fun. They're so hilarious, fun, natural to be around. Ghislaine explains our residence is being renovated, so we're staying here for the time being. Oh, actually, do you mind helping me bring the bags up to our room? Liz agreed. They went up the elevator, got to the room. Liz came in and they were still talking as normal. Then all of a sudden, Jeffrey gets up, goes to the restroom, and Ghislaine, without saying anything, goes in after him. And it's just a little bit weird. Liz is just standing there like, uh, okay, I don't know what they're doing. Then they come back out in bathrobes. And again, it wasn't the craziest thing in the world. I mean, they didn't make it weird. They're still having open conversations about casual stuff. It just seemed like maybe they're turning down for the night. And then out of nowhere, the entire energy of the room shifts. Jeffrey and Ghislaine start making out in front of Liz intensely. Liz has zero idea on what to do. I mean, this is, does she just say, okay, bye, thank you, and leave? Does she wait it out and hope that they're done in three seconds so that she can politely excuse herself? She doesn't even know. She can't even fully run through her options before Ghislaine starts waving at her to join them. Ghislaine kept narrating what Jeffrey likes, how she pleases him, but Ghislaine's voice was never in this weird, overtly 
Zhuo Wei, it almost sounded like a big sister teaching a younger sister how to braid her hair. It sounded so natural and almost normal. Liz stated the night escalated into full assault, and as soon as she had the opportunity to run away, she ran away. And Liz left as quickly as possible, ran home. She quit her job at Henry Bendel. She wanted to get as far away from her job, as far away from Ghislaine as possible. She wanted to just get over that night, like forget about that night and try to move on from the trauma. A few weeks later, Liz is working at a new high-end retailer. A woman walks in through the door. I'm looking for Liz. It was Ghislaine Maxwell. For three years, Liz tried changing her phone number, her apartment, her job. Ghislaine and Jeffrey always found her. Because Ghislaine and Jeffrey always get what they want. There's an interesting quote that's history repeats itself, but in such a cunning disguise that we never detect the resemblance until the damage is done. So it's, I guess it's supposed to mean that history is running on a cycle. We're doing the same things over and over again, and we don't even realize it because it's so cunning. Ghislaine Maxwell seemed to be modeling past island little saint jeff's after her childhood whether this is intentional or subconscious the similarities between the island and galane's childhood are eerily creepy so we briefly went over the island in part one but jeffrey epstein owned an island in the u.s virgin islands where he would take honestly whoever he wanted sometimes he held scientific conventions there where he and 20 of the top physicists in the world including the likes of stephen hawking would explore the concept of gravity other times he would go there with his closest friends who's been on that island has been hotly debated names like bill clinton naomi campbell stephen hawking prince andrew the obamas like they've all come up their presence on the island has all been debated but the locals that were there they knew that young girls were constantly on that island they don't know about the clintons or the obamas or naomi campbell or any of these people but they nicknamed epstein's plane as the lolita express because every time he would fly in with a plane full of underage girls and they would be barely clothed just lounging in the sun with epstein it's stated by victims that the island is where a lot of the trafficking and the quote loaning out to celebrities ceos world leaders happened because of how secure it is, the island is controlled by Epstein. It's his own lawless land. You can only get to it by landing his private jet on a nearby bigger island, then taking his helicopter to Little St. Jeff's. Allegedly, Epstein purchased a ton of sea urchins, like the spiky shelled black balls to put into the ocean to spread throughout so that nobody could get on or off his island without him knowing about it. It's basically like being completely deserted on an isolated island. There have been allegations of rituals being held on the island where the rich and influential have sacrificed children in exchange for more power. Allegations of group intimate relations with world leaders and underage children. It's also alleged that what we know about everything that happened on the island is only tip of the iceberg. It's stated that a big group of Jeffrey Epstein's victims on the island were foreigners, underage foreigners from Eastern Europe that were flown in to be trafficked, abused, and then flown back with threats and fear. It's been corroborated to a degree by another victim from the island that said this was true and that Epstein would joke about how it's perfect because they don't have to listen to the girls talk because nobody understands their language. There are allegations that victims' passports were confiscated on the island and it became a jail. They had lost all ability to say no to anything. They were completely powerless. But the frustrating thing is, we don't know for 100% certain what happened on that island. We know bits and pieces from victims, but the full scale of all the crimes that took place, I don't know if we'll ever know. But I can present you with some of the stuff that we do know. And what we know about this island and how it was run, it seems alarmingly similar to Ghislaine's childhood. So I'm going to try to give you little bits and pieces of both because it's kind of eerie. It, a lot of this was told in Sarah Ransom's book where she was lured to the island by a friend of hers. She was recruited essentially to the island. She gets there, her passport's taken, she has no way off, and she's being assaulted. It's bad. So growing up, Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine's father, believed that his whole life, women are just there strictly for men's pleasure. I mean, they're strictly there as objects to be used at his convenience. He would hit on other women in front of his wife. He would hit on those women's daughters in front of that woman and in front of his wife. I mean, women for him were just a good time. That's it. On the island, Sarah remembers Ghislaine was going to be arriving separately from everyone. And Sarah was so nervous and excited to finally meet this woman that every other girl on the island was talking about. Some even called her Mama Bear. 
One girl told her she's powerful, wealthy, and she knows everybody. Don't cross her. Just stay out of her way and you're going to be fine. Just do whatever she tells you to do. When Ghislaine's helicopter landed, Sarah nervously waved hello when Ghislaine got off because what else are you supposed to do? Ghislaine looked her up and down, walked past her, because to Ghislaine, just like Robert Maxwell, Sarah and these other girls were nothing. They are trash. Growing up, Ghislaine's dad trained her to be some sort of some sort of a ranger, connector. She was always putting two people together. So when her dad, Robert, would host parties at the Hill Hall, Ghislaine was expected to bring people she thought would be interesting for her dad or bring people that would be interesting for her dad's friends, i.e. very young woman. And she was really good at it. Ghislaine would always find the right people to connect. She knew how to read people. She knew how to read the room. She knew exactly what people were looking for. Ghislaine would make such seamless, smooth introductions between two parties that you would never even know that all of this was masterfully planned and meticulously executed by Ghislaine. She just had a way of making everything, normalizing every single social interaction. On the island... Sarah claimed Ghislaine would wake her up in the middle of the night to go service Epstein. Even if she told Ghislaine she was bleeding from the assaults from earlier that day, Ghislaine would calm her down and forcibly drag her if she needed to because her job is to connect the two. She's there to arrange the meeting between Sarah and Jeffrey Epstein and she was going to get her job done. Growing up, it's said Ghislaine developed an ED at just three years old. They say it's one of the main reasons that the Maxwells spoiled Ghislaine more than the rest of the kids. Her parents felt like she was really neglected when she was a baby. So right around the time of Ghislaine's birth, the eldest son of the Maxwell family had slipped into a coma. And a lot of people were just not paying attention to Ghislaine. And it's speculated by Ghislaine's parents that Ghislaine developed a terrible eating disorder at just three years old to try and receive some attention. On the island, Ghislaine tells Sarah she's too heavy. You being 5'9 and 146 pounds is not to Jeffrey's liking. Ghislaine would make sure that all the delicious food that the chef prepared were off limits to Sarah. All the snacks would be locked up. When the rest of the group would sit down to eat, Sarah was given thin slices of cucumber, tomato, and tiny, tiny portions of meat. The other girls would glance at her. And Sarah, she can't leave this island. She's being abused. There's no way out. There's no escape. She's miserable. And now she's being starved. She's taking giant gulps of water in between bites of cucumber to try and fill her stomach. Growing up, Ghislaine had these Sunday weekly reviews. Every Sunday during family dinner, the Maxwell kids would be instructed to stand around the dinner table. They can't sit down. They would have to stay standing until Father Maxwell would walk in and the room would be silent. Everyone would have their shoulders pushed back, their chest forward, and they would wait for him to sit down at the seat at the head of the table. And he would probably say something along the lines of, proceed. The children would have to go one by one, giving a full presentation to Robert Maxwell about what they did this week, what they achieved, and what they hope to achieve next week. If he didn't like their responses, they don't get to sit down. They don't get to eat. He would take off their belt and whip them and then send them up to their rooms where they would have to write him an apology letter after getting whipped. On the island, Ghislaine would have Sarah stand up at the dinner table and had all the other girls point out all the, quote, fat parts of her body. And she would laugh, you're enormous. If you didn't eat for an entire month, you'd still be overweight and disgusting. Other days, she would grab Sarah's waist at the dinner table, have Sarah stand up and start poking at her waist. Look how massive you are today. It looks like we need to cut down even on cucumbers. Ghislaine told her the only acceptable weight for her at that height was 114 pounds, which would actually classify Sarah as underweight. But Ghislaine did not care. Growing up, Ghislaine's mom never stepped in to help when the kids were being belittled or berated by Robert Maxwell. She took a very passive approach. Some would even argue that she let it happen. On the island, there were a lot of girls that looked at Ghislaine like a mother figure. Shantae was one of those girls. Shantae came to the island because she thought this was a great opportunity to become a masseuse. She remembered the first time on the island, she felt like she was in a fantasy land. She was a princess. Everyone had their own separate villas that were separated from each other and the beautiful candlelit dinner. I mean, Shantae went back to her villa and someone had lit a candle in the room, left a book on the nightstand and had a mosquito net set up around her bed. It's like a dream. She remembered the first night she plopped down on her bed thinking, this is going to be the best job in the world. I get to travel the world and I just do massages. Incredible. She starts reading her book. She's getting ready to fall asleep when she hears a knock on the door. It's one of Epstein's assistants. Jeffrey's ready for his massage. 
Shantae thought it was odd, but she was hired to be a masseuse and technically it's a private island. Maybe island time works differently. I mean, she tried to convince herself this is completely normal, right? Because if you're hired to be a private masseuse, it's not like you just work business hours. She follows Jeffrey's assistant, goes to his villa. The massage table was all set up and the waves were crashing outside on the rocks. And Shantae kept thinking, well, okay, this is a little uncomfortable, but at least Ghislaine is nearby. Because I don't know if that's his girlfriend or his wife or what, but... She's like the mom of the group. Shantae waited for Jeffrey, and he burst in with a rope, threw it off, and climbed onto the table. He looked incredibly smug, she said. Then he grabbed her wrist and tugged her toward the bed, pulled her on top of him, and he assaulted her. She stated the more she struggled, the more fun he was having. When he was done, he just jumped up, left her there, hopped into the shower. Shantae said she was so traumatized, she got up, threw on her shorts, ran all the way back to her villa without her shoes, cutting up completely... The whole bottom of her feet was all bloody and she cried herself to sleep. And she kept thinking there were so many people. Ghislaine was there. She was nearby. She knew Ghislaine heard her scream and Ghislaine did nothing. There were 70 staff members on that island. How did they not see anything? I mean, Ghislaine warned the employees that there would be a lot of women around. She explained it to the employees as they're going to be bees around the honey pot. But I'm Queen Bee. Always remember that. And it was impossible to forget. Ghislaine was a demanding bee. There were about 70 staff members on the private island alone. Some of them called her Hurricane Ghislaine. They said whenever she got to the island, all tranquility, all peacefulness, out, gone, out the door. And her way with staff was to treat them, quote, like the help. I mean, she was ruthless. The workers there were explicitly told not to be seen unless requested, and they weren't allowed in most buildings where the abuse was taking place. So many victims stated it's perfectly understandable that some of the staff didn't even know what was going on. But they say a photo is worth a thousand words. And there is a painting of Bill Clinton that was saying a lot. There was a painting of Bill Clinton hung in Jeffrey Epstein's New York City mansion. It's of Bill Clinton in a blue dress and red heels. Former President Clinton is sitting, dangling his legs off the side of an armchair and pointing at you or whoever's looking at this painting. And he's smiling in almost like this coquettish manner. Some people have interpreted this painting to be the one that pokes at Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky because Monica Lewinsky is the woman that Bill Clinton had an affair with while he was president of the United States. Side note, the power imbalance there is like a whole other story for another day. But she wore a iconic blue dress that was stained with the president's bodily fluids after an intimate incident that they had. She wore the blue dress for the rest of her day working as an intern in the White House because she thought it was spinach dip that she had spilt on her dress. It was not spinach dip. I mean, I guess it could be argued that it's the blue dress Hillary Clinton wore to the 2009 Kennedy Center honors. It's not, but it could be. I guess art is about who interprets it. And the interpretation that the internet had of this painting being hung in Jeffrey Epstein's New York City estate was he was sending a message because if he knows Bill Clinton personally and still purchased this piece of art and hung it up, it almost felt like he was outwardly telling people, I have stuff on Bill Clinton. I have stuff on everyone. I can make fun at former presidents because what are they going to do to me? Jeffrey Epstein was also known to keep a collection of photos of very powerful people that he had ties to, allegedly. He had a wall of photos that included Woody Allen, Bill Clinton, the Prince of Saudi Arabia, Pope John Paul II, and Cuba's Fidel Castro. Now, just to preface and disclaim, just because there are pictures of them on his walls doesn't mean they were in any way friendly with one another or even met each other, or even if they did, that still does not explicitly imply guilt of any sort of crime or even morally corrupt action. So, don't kill me. Honestly, I should just leave it there. But I will say, a lot of the photographs included individuals who had scandals of their own. So it's just very interesting. But more damning in Jeffrey Epstein's photo collection were photos of young girls in small bikinis or naked girls pictured on the beach. There were several photos of various girls engaging in group activities with one another and with Epstein. There's a crudely drawn picture of a baby and a skull, as well as a real photo of a girl that appears to be around six years old wearing a short dress, bending over and exposing her back. But that's not even the picture that brought this case to the forefront of all the international news. Instead, it was a picture of 17-year-old Virginia Jufre wearing a tank top, a pair of jeans, there's Ghislaine Maxwell standing in the back, and Prince Andrew of the British royal family with his arm on 17-year-old Virginia's bare waist. There is a room in Florida where there are so many valuables in this room. 
crystals, chandeliers, museum level statues. But if you really want to rob the place because, I don't know, you have a wish to be imprisoned, I don't advise anyone to do that. But if you must, they say you should peel off the walls. Not for the artwork that's hanging there, but the room is plastered with $7 million worth of gold leaf. Or if you think that's way too complicated, just steal a bathroom sink or two because there are gold-plated sinks worth over $100,000 per sink. It is the 20,000 square foot ballroom in Mar-a-Lago, former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago club in Palm Beach. Did you know they charge $200,000 for your initiation fee? It's a one-time payment that you don't get back. There's also an annual fee of about $16,000 that you have to pay. But even if you have the money and you want to spend it at Mar-a-Lago, you can't. They have a 500-member cap and each applicant must be vetted and referred by a current member. And then Trump himself will sign every single approved applicant. Jeffrey Epstein was banned indefinitely from Mar-a-Lago. He wasn't even a member and he got banned. I feel like that got, that sounds more impressive than being, being a member. A, yeah, exactly. Allegedly, Ghislaine was the one who knew Trump, not Epstein. And through Epstein's connection with Ghislaine, Epstein started visiting Mar-a-Lago, even though he's not a member. I don't know if that's against the club rules. I don't know if the rich are allowed to break club rules, but it seemed like Trump didn't really care until one day he gets a call from a very angry member. He states that his young daughter was laying out by the pool when a man approached her, giving her some sort of reason on why she needed to go to his mansion. And she went, probably assuming everyone at the club was at least familiar with her family, maybe a family friend. It'd probably be safe. So she went and he tried to convince her to get naked. So she ran out of there, called her dad, who immediately directly called Trump, very upset about what transpired. And Epstein was banned from ever stepping foot on Mar-a-Lago ever again. That is a crazy, crazy story. But Ghislaine wasn't. Virginia said the same thing happened to her. But she didn't have rich parents to call Trump. Virginia was a changing room assistant at Mar-a-Lago, making $9 an hour. Her dad worked there as a maintenance manager. One day, Virginia found her dad at work, and she was excitedly telling him about this new opportunity that she had. One of the very wealthy members had asked her if she wanted to work for her and earn a massage therapist license. I mean, it seemed perfect because she would probably pay more than the club, and Virginia would get a license from it, meaning it would only open more doors for her future. Virginia was so excited, and her dad wanted to support her, so after work, he personally drove her. Her dad personally drove her to Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, where Ghislaine met with the both of them in the driveway. Ghislaine reassured Virginia's dad that they would have Virginia home safe and sound later tonight so he could just get home and rest. He trusted them. They're members of the club. So Virginia's dad left. Virginia was escorted upstairs with Ghislaine. She's 16, 17 at the time. She has zero experience with massages. She's never even gotten a massage at this point, so she has no idea how it works. She goes upstairs, the door swings open, and she's shocked. Jeffrey Epstein is laying there naked on the table. Virginia is like contemplating running out, but she reasons with herself because our brains are incredible at reasoning with ourselves that maybe this is normal. Like maybe you just put a towel over, right? But then Ghislaine starts taking off her shirt and starts rubbing her bare chest on Jeffrey Epstein's body with massage oils, implying to Virginia and stating that this is what she needs to do. They coerce Virginia into taking off her clothes. She just did as she was told. I mean, she didn't know what else to do. That was the very first time the two of them assaulted Virginia Giuffre. Virginia Giuffre would be one of the key victims to take down the trafficking ring. Even the newest court document releases, those were from Virginia Dufresne's defamation lawsuit against Ghislaine. But unfortunately, that also means that Virginia Dufresne would endorse some of the worst, most extensive and traumatizing acts committed by Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Virginia stated that she was essentially loaned out to basically service all the other high-powered friends that Epstein and Maxwell had. Virginia said, I was trained to be everything a man wanted me to be. It was interesting training they wanted me to be able to cater to all the needs of the men they were going to send me to they said that they loved that i was very compliant and knew how to keep my mouth shut about what they expected me to do epstein and Ghislaine also told me that they wanted me to produce information for them in addition to performing sex on the men they told me to pay attention to the details about the men so that i could report back to them virginia stated that she was terrified she said she couldn't leave or speak up sooner because He could have had me killed or abducted, and I knew he was capable of that if I didn't obey him. She said, I realized that my only purpose for Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell and their friends was to be used for sex. Virginia stated that she was 
working with them and Jeffrey had sex with underage girls on a daily basis. She said his interest in this kind of sex was obvious to the people around him. The activities were so obvious and bold that anyone spending any significant time at any one of Jeffrey Epstein's residences would have clearly been aware of what was going on. In a deposition, Virginia stated, in addition to constantly finding underage girls to satisfy their personal desires, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell also got girls for Jeffrey Epstein's friends and acquaintances. Jeffrey Epstein specifically told me that the reason for him doing this was that they would, quote, owe him, that they would, quote, be in his pocket, and he would, quote, have something on them. I understood that Jeffrey Epstein thought he could get leniency if he was ever caught doing anything illegal or he could escape trouble altogether. Virginia would come forward with allegations that she was essayed by Prince Andrew three times, once in London, once in New York City, and another once in a group activity session on the island. Virginia stated, quote, I knew he was a member of the British royal family, but I just called him Andy. I got news from Ghislaine Maxwell that I would be meeting a prince later that day. Jeffrey Epstein told me I was meeting a major prince. Jeffrey Epstein told me to exceed everything I had been taught. He emphasized whatever Prince Andrew wanted, I was to make sure he got. Prince Andrew would state that he has no recollection of meeting this lady, even though there's a picture of them together when she was 17. But he said, no, 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 no to all of it. That's what Prince Andrew said in an interview about the allegations. He also argued that the photo of him in Virginia must be edited because those are his traveling clothes that he's wearing. But it's stated that the picture was taken in London, which to him doesn't make sense because he only travels in his traveling clothes. Prince Andrew also states that men always remember every single time they have intimate relations because it's a positive experience. So the fact that he cannot remember intimate relations with Virginia basically means that it didn't happen. In the end, Prince Andrew settled out of court and it's rumored that Virginia Giuffre was given more than $12 million, which I believe she's putting into a charity that she's started. But even with the settlement, Prince Andrew has denied all allegations. Soon after the settlement, the queen stripped him of all of his royal titles, which was incredibly significant because it is alleged that Prince Andrew was Queen Elizabeth's favorite son. Virginia Giuffre said, cages come in many forms, and I can tell you my cage might have been a golden cage, but it was a cage nonetheless. I was very alone and there was no way out. It's speculated that humans evolve to be able to sense when others are looking at us and watching us. Everyone at the Daily Mirror, Ghislaine's dad's company, knew that Robert Maxwell was watching them. He would bug the executives' phones. It was known that people at the Daily Mirror would have meetings where they just wrote down their thoughts rather than saying it because everyone knew that Robert Maxwell was listening to them. Even at home, Robert Maxwell would hide recording devices into antique lamps because he wanted to hear everything his family was saying about him at all times. Jeffrey Epstein allegedly did the same thing. Sarah Ransom states that every inch of his properties, including the island, was monitored with cameras every single inch. Robert Maxwell watched Ghislaine and everybody else in his life. Ghislaine and Jeffrey watched all their victims. But someone was watching Jeffrey. And I think he knew it. He had a new addition to his art collection, a photorealistic painting he personally commissioned that depicted a prison scene with him in the middle of barbed wires and guards. This is after he got out of prison the first time. So he gets a photo commissioned, like a painting commissioned of him in prison. And he told a friend about the painting and he said, that's me. I want this painting so that I am always remembering the possibility that that could be me again. Like I could always go back to prison, which is objectively, I guess, a smart reminder. But the problem is Jeffrey got too comfortable and forgot that people are watching him. July 8th, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested for conspiracy to commit sex trafficking and sex trafficking of underage girls in New York State. It's likely he didn't know that he was being watched or investigated or studied because he got aboard his private jet, flew in from Paris, landed in New Jersey, where he was greeted by a fleet of cars, the FBI and NYPD. The minute he stepped on American soil, he was arrested and placed in handcuffs. How did he not know that they were watching him? If he knew, he probably would have stayed in France or fled somewhere else. He had the means, he had the money. The authorities would later find fake passports in his New York City townhouse safe. I'm sure he had more. By all accounts, Jeffrey Epstein seemed genuinely surprised that he was arrested a second time, 10 years after his first arrest. Even after his first arrest, Epstein told the New York Post, I'm not a sexual predator, I'm an offender. It's the difference between a murderer and a person who steals a bagel. He's saying he just stole a bagel, that's it. But now, 10 years later, just like the Maxwell Empire, the Epstein Empire was going to crumble down in disgrace. And everything that Ghislaine had worked for the past 10 years was gone, down the drain. Yeah, sure, the trafficking ring 
yeah, okay, that's down the drain. But additionally, Ghislaine kept herself very, very busy after Jeffrey's first arrest in 2008, 10 years ago, okay? She wanted to completely reinvent herself to be a new woman, the water woman. Side note, Jeffrey and Ghislaine were very much close after his first arrest. It didn't seem like anything ever really changed. People said that Ghislaine was still organizing and planning all of Epstein's massages, even after he got out of prison. But she also created a network, like a method where girls would recruit other girls and she would just kind of sit at the top to make sure everything was going accordingly. Ghislaine was reinventing herself after Jeffrey Epstein came out of prison the first time. She started her own nonprofit called Terra Mar in 2012. She said it was her project for humanity. The focus was on cleaning up the 8 million metric tons of plastic debris, the garbage that's dumped into the world's oceans every year. So she would host these TED Talks where she asked, is anybody here staying awake at night because they're frightened about the ocean? Are you scared about what could happen? Are you trying to think about what you could do that would help the ocean and all its myriad of troubles. She would invite her friends over, and instead of talking about writing a book now to get Jeffrey to marry her or throw tea parties in her undergarments, Ghislaine was now spending all her time at dinner parties talking about saving the ocean, the deep sea, and all the animals that live there that need saving. It's like she was trying to tie herself to a bigger picture, a big cause that was more than, why is Epstein obsessed with massages? But some people who knew her said, I mean, she could not care less about the ocean, okay? At a conference in South Carolina, she was busy talking to everybody that would listen about Tara Mar. I mean, she sounded really passionate. So there was one filmmaker who had no idea anything about Ghislaine Maxwell's life, and he was convinced by her excitement to change the planet. So he offered to help her shoot this promotional video that would encourage viewers to sign a petition. They planned out the whole video and just to make sure that he knew what was going on and what color she was going to wear, he asked her, wait, what are you going to wear? And she's like, oh, the Terramar shirt that I plan on releasing. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. But you should see me in my full leather outfit with weapons. He was like, that's so strange. That happened out of nowhere. And she's like, you know, Laura Croft from Tomb Raider? I'm the real life version of her. He said it was incredibly but in a creepy way like there was something off about it it was weird anyway the next morning they meet up on the beach to shoot the video and she's wearing the Terramar shirt which looks like the I Heart NYC shirt but it's I Heart squiggle squiggle so like I Heart waves she paired it with jeans and stilettos on the sand are you here to save the ocean or get some pictures for Instagram he had no idea the producer said it was more like a glamour shoot than anything he said it's like she was trying to reinvent herself with the ocean but she was the same exact person and none of us can run away from ourselves but Ghislaine still tried she would go to the United Nations and give speeches about what we need to do for the oceans people would even joke with her you Maxwell seem to love it underwater Wait, 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 what does that mean? Because she loves water, her dad drowned. Oh, man. Yeah, Ghislaine thought it was hilarious, apparently, and tipped her head back and laughed. She even went to a fundraiser event in New York City after Epstein's first arrest that was for stopping sex trafficking. She showed up, took a few pictures, and left. The fundraisers were confused why she even came, but also they noted she did not donate a single cent. And her sex trafficking partner in crime was now sitting in prison for the second time, suspiciously dead, just like her dad. Jeffrey Epstein was found suspended in his jail cell. His death was officially deemed a self-exit, but there's even a Wikipedia page called Jeffrey Epstein Isn't Dead. So there's a few camps of people out there. One group that thinks that he self-exited, another group that thinks that he was killed, and one group that thinks that he's not dead at all, that he's alive, and the Jeffrey Epstein in that cell is a lookalike. So let's explore the first thing very briefly the official theory jeffrey epstein self-exited experts stated that jeffrey epstein had no defensive wounds and just going over his last few days in prison people said that it was very tumultuous a few days before jeffrey's death it stated that his state was declining very rapidly in regards to his mental health it was reported that he was agitated he couldn't properly sleep the toilet in his unit kept running so the prison had a toilet overflowing plumbing problem so the whole place was infested with like feces urine and infested with rats and cockroaches he couldn't sleep because the toilet was running all night and he has sleep apnea so he would allegedly sit in the corner sleep deprived rocking back and forth covering his ears calling himself a coward sometimes he would just crawl up on the floor and try to sleep on the floor he stopped showering his beard was unkept and a few days before his death he attempted to self-exit the psychologist stated inmate has multiple risk factors for self-exiting as identified by bop statistics let's be proactive 
Jail officials noted in logs that Epstein was, quote, sitting at the edge of his bed, lost in thought, and, quote, sitting with his head against the wall. Another facility assistant emailed the jail official stating Epstein seemed, quote, dazed and withdrawn. She wrote, just to be on the safe side, can someone from site come and talk to him? He also left a meeting with his attorney to go call his mom. His mom has been dead for 15 years. So it's speculated that perhaps he was losing his grip. Others felt like by self-exiting, Epstein was getting the last laugh. I mean, it's like he's saying, screw you, which a lot of people close to him said that it would fit exactly what Epstein would do. He was someone that wanted to have control till the very last end. He wanted to have the final laugh, the final say, the final word. Days before Epstein's death, he was making adjustments in his will that would impact how his assets were going to be handled. He changed it so that his $500 million-ish fortune would go to a trust in the U.S. Virgin Islands, the 1953 trust named after the year he was born, but we have no idea who the benefactors of this trust are. For all we know, he could still be paying the people who helped him commit these crimes. Right now? Yeah. Nobody knows where his money's at? This was really purposeful because by putting the money in a trust in the U.S. Virgin Islands, it would be really hard for the victims to get money. I believe there is a separate victim fund trust set up in the U.S. from the proceeds of his real estate sales that would go to victims, but still. He wrote to the, you know, the U.S. gymnastics team doctor that was convicted of abusing athletes? Well, he wrote to him in prison. That letter never got to Larry, and we don't know what he wrote in the letter, but that was like a few weeks before his death. It was just odd. So people speculate, yeah, no, it seems like he self-exited. The next theory is that perhaps he was murdered. Some people think it's a little simpler. Maybe he was murdered by someone in prison, you know, and maybe someone high profile paid someone in prison to do it. Maybe the inmate just didn't like people that abused children. Others stated, no, he was murdered by high profile people. It was a hit job. I don't know, but I do know that the guards, the two guards that were sitting 15 feet away from Jeffrey Epstein's prison cell when he was murdered or when he was dead, they were supposed to do rounds every 30 minutes, but they didn't. They just forged the documents and the records to make it seem like they did. But in reality, they were on their phones, online shopping for furniture and motorcycles. They also fell asleep for two hours. They stated it was because they were overworked due to the lack of staffing. There were only 18 guards in the entire prison that day. That's 12 stories tall and houses close to 800 inmates. One of the two guards was on a 16-hour shift. So that was kind of their excuse of, that's why we didn't realize that he was dead in his cell. But other people thought, maybe that's not why. Maybe it's because you're not supposed to tell us what you saw. Did someone come in and kill Jeffrey Epstein and stage it? Maybe the guards weren't paying attention. Maybe they were. Jeffrey Epstein did tell a psychologist that he was too much of a coward to self-exit. And one psychologist wrote that, Epstein was very future oriented. He explicitly told her, why would you ever think I'm suicidal? I'm not suicidal and I would never be. It's also stated that Epstein was supposed to be hopeful when he died because his attorneys were on the verge of filing a motion that would argue his non-prosecution agreement in Florida would apply in New York City somehow. So I don't know. There's other arguments where people argue where his ligature marks were on his neck. So people were saying, regardless of his mental health, they believe that the marks on his neck were not consistent with self-exiting. Netizen stated that the marks on his neck were too low. When you're suspended, the marks would naturally be higher up near your ears. They stated that the lines on Epstein's neck were more consistent with someone coming up behind Epstein and strangling him. But I would say most people think that Epstein was killed by someone powerful. After Epstein got out of prison the first time he was arrested, he allegedly joked to his close friends and said, everyone thinks they know me now, but no, I'm the one that has everything on them. It's insinuated that Epstein had blackmail on powerful people. The theory, the conspiracy, the same source does not think that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. They stated that he is way too important to way too many people. There are stories that came out that Jeffrey Epstein had every single guest bedroom and every single property, even the bathrooms, wired with secret hidden cameras. He was able to record very powerful people having sex with underage girls. He had saved all of those tapes and used those to gain his own power and wealth. And that's why nobody knows how he even made his money. A lot of victims stated that they never saw him work a day in his life. No business calls, like nothing. It was weird. And nobody really knows how he made his money. Netizens say it aligns with victims coming forward saying that Epstein would tell them to snoop on all these men that they were being abused by and bring him all these salacious secretive details about them. But then on the other side, you have people saying, but why haven't there been official mention of any of these videos? Or why haven't they been not released, but taken in for evidence and everybody involved would have been arrested? The conspiracy theorists say, well, because everyone in the videos are too powerful. 
not in the sense that they can control the government, but in the sense that if they all go down, the world will see just how corrupt our world leaders are and our industry moguls are, and people will turn from the government. All trust, the social contracts will be broken. There will be some sort of uprising. That's the theory by netizens. It would be too damaging because it's not just one politician. It might be all of them. There are conspiracy theorists who believe that world order would be absolutely destroyed with the knowledge of these tapes existing getting out. And then you have the theory that he's not really dead. There is an alleged photo of Epstein from his cell dead, and allegedly the photo doesn't add up with the facial proportions. So his ears and nose don't match his photo when he's alive, the side profile. So the alleged photo of him dead shows a much more curved nose at the bottom, at the tip, and the nose bridge is a bit slopier. But Jeffrey Epstein's side profile from when he's alive, the nose bridge is a bit straighter and it's a little bit more pointed at the tip. His ear, the alleged photo of him dead, the ear cartilage is a lot spinier and busier. There's more ear cartilage like showing in his ear and it looks like. But when he's alive, the side profile, it doesn't look like that. So for those reasons, some people believe that he's out there living with his $500 million trust, living his best life. So Jeffrey Epstein is dead and Ghislaine Maxwell is on the run. <laughs> Ghislaine Maxwell was not arrested. She had multiple citizenships, so she could technically be anywhere. Paris, Brazil, in a bunker, in a submarine. We don't even know how much money she has access to at this point, or even now. So July 2nd, 2022, 11 months after Jeffrey Epstein's death, in a tree-lined hill of New Hampshire, like in a cabin, which cabin makes it sound like she's in the woods being one with nature. This mm -hmm. cabin is massive. It's surrounded by endless, beautiful pine trees. It's a luxury oasis. There's a giant window that's like two stories tall that's letting in all this sunlight. It's secluded. It's isolated. I would imagine if I had to rent this cabin for a month, it'd be tens of thousands of dollars. It's a beautiful, luxurious, well-equipped facility. And it even has an ironic name. It's called Tucked Away. Helicopters start flying up above the trees. Authorities and squad cars show up. Officers are hiding behind the tree trunks. And they know that Ghislaine Maxwell is in there. And they're not leaving until they get her. So why is she in the U.S.? We don't know. A lot of people speculate that she thought it would just die down. People would just kind of get over it. What? Yeah. This is a little goofy, but I mean, you have the FBI out there trying to get Ghislaine and she knows this. She's done for. Like, she still tries to flee. She runs from room to room trying to outrun the FBI. They eventually found her, caught her, and her phone was covered in tinfoil because she thought the aluminum foil would block her cell signal. No way. Yeah. This is crazy. She was arrested at 58 years old and she was facing 38 years to 50 years in prison. Now, people who knew Ghislaine personally said that she was like a shark, a great white shark. A lot of people say that she's a shark that was dealing with a lot, that she was struggling with deep insecurities, probably caused by her dad. I mean, there are theories that she was just looking to find another Robert Maxwell for her life. It's like she was chasing that feeling that she's never enough but wants to keep trying for a man. I think that there's a few ways that people perceive Ghislaine. I mean, especially the ones that were close to her or knew her personally. It seems like there's the ones that believe that Ghislaine was victimized by her father and that she was looking high and low to fill this gaping hole in her life for a father figure. She meets Jeffrey Epstein and she starts just going from this deeply wounded woman to a monster. That Ghislaine was so desperate for the attention and love for these men that she was willing to be a vile, evil being. I mean, side note, this is what some acquaintances and a small group of netizens believe. But just remember, to be a monster, you have to already have those traits in you. That's how I feel. But those close to the pair said, Ghislaine was obsessed with him genuinely would do anything for him when the fbi raided epstein's house they found this hard drive that was registered under Ghislaine's name and it could be inferred that she's the one using it they found a microsoft word document that she was working on and it read like Ghislaine's writing but pretending to be someone else it reads Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell have been together as a couple for the past 11 years. They are, contrary to what people believe, rarely apart. I always see them together. Ghislaine Maxwell is highly intelligent and great company with a ready smile and an infectious laugh. Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell share many mutual interests and are a lot of fun together. They both have inquisitive minds. Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell complement each other really well, and I cannot imagine one without the other. On top of being great partners, they are always best friends. I don't get it. What is that? 
it seems like she was writing it to submit it into some sort of article or newspaper. It's like she was just so obsessed with him. What kind of grown woman talks about her relationship, barely their relationship in third person form? It's like she needs to convince people that they love each other. Then there are those who believe that Ghislaine was just a monster. She's just an evil parrot. People said that when she would come into work at her dad's office, because of course she got a job there, she was just, um, when her dad wasn't there, she would just try to copy her dad. She would parrot her dad. She would be incredibly loud and aggressive. It's just she didn't have her own personality, but she was rude. She was evil. She did everything for herself. That's all she cared about at the end of the day was herself. Even what she did for Jeffrey Epstein, all these girls were a means to an end. Just to give you an idea, I mean, the way that Ghislaine treated people, especially the house staff, is insane. I, I do think that this is kind of crazy. She wrote a 58-page booklet with hundreds of checklist items on how she wanted things done in the residence. She would get infuriated if someone broke the oftentimes completely unreasonable rules. The rules read, in the grooming guest relations section, appearance is extremely important if high standards are to be maintained. A favorable first impression goes a long way. Personal cleanliness, good presentation, and a genuine and polite aim to please approach are very important. Try and anticipate the needs of Mr. Epstein and Miss Maxwell and their guests. Make guests feel pampered and welcome. Do not discuss personal problems with guests. Remember that you see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing, except to answer a question directed at you. Inobtrusive is the key. Wear the appropriate clothing, dark blue trousers with white golf shirts to be worn daily, long sleeve white shirts for dinner service. Items in pockets must not create a bulge or be visible. Do not address Mr. Epstein, Miss Maxwell, and other guests with hands in your pockets. Do not chew gum. Avoid using strong perfume or aftershave lotion. This could cause an allergic reaction. And smile. Another section is titled Proper Language. What you say is as important as what you do. Your language must include good diction and exclude swear words and slang. You do not say, yeah, sure, no problem. You bet, gotcha, I don't know. You do say, yes, mister, of course, miss, my pleasure. It's no trouble at all. You're quite right. I would be very pleased to. I have no idea, but I will find out immediately. To a compliment, you must say, you are very kind. Thank you, miss. I enjoyed doing it. To justified criticism or mistakes, you say, I am very sorry it will not happen again. It was completely my fault and I will make the changes immediately. What to say when entering a room? May I come in? Greet whoever is inside the room. You do not expound on weather or any other subject unless asked. You provide your service and then ask, is there anything else I might do for you? If not, leave the room. When answering the phone, do not slam the receiver at any time. All calls should be answered within three rings or less. It even has very strict rules for Ghislaine Maxwell's breakfast. Maxwell House coffee served with milk, freshly squeezed orange juice, glass of water, one Weetabix with sliced banana, milk and sugar on the side. So I guess it's up for you to interpret how you see Ghislaine. I will say I don't think in any scenario she is the victim, but... I guess it's the question of, is she a right-hand woman or is she the mastermind? Did she do what Jeffrey told her to do or did she plan, execute, and mastermind a trafficking ring for the ultra-wealthy? Ghislaine once said in an interview, you tell me one person you know and take 20 people who know that person, they're all going to give you different versions of what they think of that person. One victim stated Ghislaine was worse than Jeffrey. She said Ghislaine got off in her own way from these assaults. Ghislaine got off on making those high-powered men happy. She felt validated from it. Before the trial, Ghislaine's attorney made a statement. They said, Ghislaine is in a very, very difficult condition. Conditions none of us wish on our worst enemies. I've never seen anything like it. It's the Epstein effect. Ghislaine's family have set up a website for her called realghislaine.com. Her brother defended her in an interview and stated, Imagine yourself arrested and imprisoned in solitary confinement, deprived of bail for nine months. Whatever your feelings about her allegations, she's entitled to a fair trial to due process. My brothers and sisters and I will never stop fighting for Ghislaine. The trial itself was very messy, mainly on the defense part. Ghislaine's defense attorneys just kept trying to insinuate that it's unfair that a woman is taking the fall for a man. In their literal opening statements, they said, ever since Eve 
was tempting Adam with the apple. Women have been blamed for the bad behavior of men. The charges against Ghislaine Maxwell are for things that Jeffrey Epstein did, but she is not Jeffrey Epstein. She is not like Jeffrey Epstein. A victim testified about her abuse that started when she was 14, but now she has overcome her trauma and became an actress. The defense attorneys were like, you're an actress? Well, can you cry on command? How do we know you're not crying on command right now? How do we know that you're not acting right now? Other times, the defense tried to use the fact that a lot of the victims grew up to battle addiction and face other obstacles in life. They just kind of threw it in their face. Like, how can we trust you if you do drugs? It was a lot. And side note, addiction is a whole other topic, but many of the victims stated that they fell into drugs to cope with their trauma. So it just felt like a very gross thing to use against them. Another victim, Annie, who is Maria's sister, she testified and the defense tried to argue that Annie was not traumatized by her abuse because she wore cowboy boots. Okay, I'm obviously summarizing, but essentially, Annie was gifted a pair of cowboy boots from Ghislaine and Jeffrey. She stopped wearing them once she escaped them, but every time she would look and see them in her closet, she felt this pain. And she thought, you know what? No, I'm going to reclaim it. It's just a pair of shoes. It was part of her overcoming her trauma. So she starts wearing the cowboy boots again, and the defense brought in her cowboy boots, showed the wear and tear, and insinuated that if Annie was actually distraught about what happened and traumatized, she would throw the boots away, and she would never be able to even wear them. The defense also tried to use the fact that some of the victims testifying were awarded anywhere between two to five million dollars in the victim compensation program as a way to show that the victims were just money hungry and that they would say anything to get money out of the fund. There's a lot of victim blaming, a lot, which is in a way expected in our justice system, but also not. And it's infuriating because, you know, it's what is going on? Why are we still doing this? And side note, when Ghislaine was asked if she would testify or not at her own trial, usually the defendant on trial will answer just a simple yes or no. But Ghislaine responded to the judge, Your Honor, the government has not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt, so there is no need for me to testify. In the end, December 29th, 2021, just a few days after Ghislaine's 60th birthday, Ghislaine was born on Christmas. The verdict came through and Ghislaine was found guilty of five of the six charges. Ghislaine was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Her attorneys will be appealing, and Ghislaine states that she too is a victim of Jeffrey Epstein and was manipulated by him. She also states that when she gets out of prison, her life goal is to help others that have been incarcerated. So that's like Terramar 2.0. Ghislaine also stated that she wishes that she never met Jeffrey Epstein, had no idea how evil he was, and according to one source, Ghislaine is writing a book in prison. The source states that Ghislaine doesn't think that she's done anything wrong, and that once people read her book and they know her true story, she will be freed. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. The source also states that Ghislaine is very upset that she, a woman, is the only one facing consequences. Ghislaine is also adamant that the picture of Prince Andrew and Virginia Dufre when she was 17 was forged. It's a fake edited photo, so it's wild. She also has zero proof. She just says, I don't know exactly how many points there are, but there are over 50 problems with that picture, so I don't believe it to be a true picture. I will say the FBI had it in their possession and never brought up any suspicions that it was altered. So hopefully, Ghislaine will spend a very long time in prison. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions with this case. Like one victim stated during the trial that she saw a picture of Ghislaine Maxwell nude and pregnant in Jeffrey Epstein's house. There have been no further details. Ghislaine is not known to be a mother. Could she have a child somewhere out there? Could that be the beneficiary to the trust? I really can't tell you. I mean, the theories just keep going on this case. They're endless. But I will say the victims who have come forward to go up against people like Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, they are the ones with the true power. They are incredibly brave and admirable. And just to give you an idea, in the 58 page rule book for the house staff, a page reads preparations checklist for master bedroom, set air conditioning at 60 degrees, two lighted pens on both bedside tables, Jeffrey Epstein's large and small notepads on both bedside tables, box of tissues on each bedside table, replace if less than one third full, gun placed in bedside table drawer. And that is the full case of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. I mean, there's a lot more online if you're interested, but these are just what we know of them from online sources, those acquaintances, anonymous sources that have come forward. And I don't know, it's just more messier than I thought it would ever be.
What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments and I will see you guys on Wednesday for the next episode.